I am very pleased to introduce Aidan Ziegler. He is a lead consultant at Cognizant Servian, uh, where he helps to um, help enterprises adopt uh, dig uh, cloud native services and through digital transformation. Uh, he's a doggy daddy, uh, but particularly uh, loves gaming, like I suppose 95% of people in this room. And again, esoteric programming languages, probably like the other 5%. So. Uh, today, he is going to get uh, deep and dirty uh, into the nitty gritty of the uh, JS node loop. Am I getting that one right? My goodness. It would be terribly. No JS. Ah. No JS event loop. Uh, so please take us away. Uh, big round of applause for Aidan Ziegler. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, big thanks to the Latency crew for uh, having me out. I'm Aidan Ziegler, and like Tanya said, I'm a lead consultant at uh, Cognizant Servian. Uh, it's a little bit nebulous, but generally my day consists of helping large enterprises digitally transform, and generally that's completing projects using modern tech stacks, which usually involve Node.js to some degree. So Node.js is a tool that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, and one of its benefits is that it's actually really forgiving. You don't need to know a lot about what's going on under the hood to use Node.js effectively. But for building performant cloud-native applications, a solid understanding of the event loop that backs Node.js is definitely good to have in your toolkit. So without further ado, this is a wait presentation, a dive under the hood of a Node.js event loop. So we're going to dive straight into the deep end. Hopefully this one doesn't come as too much of a surprise to you guys. Uh, first piece of background knowledge you're going to need for this presentation is that Node.js supports asynchronous programming. We started with callbacks. And anyone who was programming in JS during that period will remember the horrible, horrible levels of indent we all went to in our editors to support that. Then uh, we got something a little bit more succinct. So we got promises in ES uh, 2015. This made our code at least a little bit more legible. And then today, finally, in ES 2017, we got async and await. And this allowed us to breathe a collective sigh of relief at the new levels of code legibility that this provided us. So inside Node.js, we can look at two distinct types of asynchronous programming. We have asynchronous from a deferred execution perspective, and this would include tasks such as resolving a promise synchronously uh, from a value, or for, for, by returning a value, sorry, from an in-memory cache, uh, rather than making a call to an external service. Or another example would be calling process.nexttick um, in an emitter constructor to allow users to subscribe to an instance of the emitter before emitting, uh, emitting the first event from that constructor. These calls do not interact with the underlying event loop and are instead resolved within the execution of the JS runtime itself. Then we have asynchronous from a systems perspective. Now this is uh, asynchronous calls that interact with entities and services outside of the purview of the JS runtime. So this includes things like calls to the file system, DNS, APIs, some cryptography functions, basically anything that interacts with the wider world outside of the Node.js program. Uh, so these external interactions are all scheduled and handled by an asynchronous construct called the event loop. Now we'll dive into a couple of examples. First, to illustrate the point of asynchronous deferred execution, let's take a look at an asynchronous function called add that takes two numbers, A and B, and just returns a promise containing the result of adding them together. If we await this function from a higher order function, everything after it will be called at the end of the current call stack, but it will not dip into the event loop, even though it's asynchronous. Instead, the deferred execution is all handled internally in V8, and therefore, the time of execution is only bound by the runtime and the unwinding of the current call stack. Now, to contrast this with an asynchronous function that interacts with the event loop, we can use the example of this getJSON function. Um, it returns a promise resolving with the contents of a source JSON file. This interacts with the file system, which is not something natively handled by the JS runtime. Therefore, the actual work and scheduling of the code awaiting the result of this function is handled by the event loop. The event loop will execute the system request, and when it receives a response, it will return the result back to JavaScript land. So therefore, the time of execution is bound completely by the external system. So what does an event loop allow us to do? It essentially abstracts away asynchronous programming by allowing your code to focus on responding to events. Uh, anything that would normally need to be uh, driven by waiting for input or a system interrupt triggering, uh, we essentially abstract it away using the event loop. 
So at its core, an event loop runs a series of operations, with one of those operations being waiting for responses to requests and external events, and then processing those events till there's no more work to perform. And then, once again, we wait for more events to uh, pop up. So for Node.js, uh, this event loop functionality is provided by a C library called libuv. Libuv handles all of the system asynchronous calls for the JavaScript runtime and takes care of scheduling all of the callbacks. It also has kind of sweet logo, Unicorn Velociraptor. And it was originally built uh, to be used as the Node.js uh, Node event loop uh, purpose built. However, it's spread to other languages through third party packages, including Lua and Python. So, my goal for today is for everyone to leave this talk with a solid understanding of the principles behind LibUV and the way in which they relate to your experience in Node.js. Now, 99% of the time, you can run Node.js without having to know any of the content that we're about to go through. Uh, like I mentioned before, Node.js is a very forgiving language. However, I believe that understanding the tools that you're using not only makes you a better programmer, but it's also gonna allow you to explain that weird 1% edge behavior that you're gonna run into every now and again. Some of the surprising behavior that we can see in Node.js includes asynchronous cryptographic functions blocking our HTTP requests, or synchronous calls in async segments blocking other events from occurring, and Node.js refusing to exit when we really want it to. So, a bit of a disclaimer before we get into the bulk of the talk. This talk is gonna focus on Linux. Uh, the nice part about libuv is a whole bunch of C if defs that make it present a uniform interface across basically all of the platforms that you can run Node.js on. Uh, but I'm going to assume most of you are running Node.js on Linux. If you're running production Node on Windows, then good luck with that. <laughs> if you are running production Node on Mac, please call me, because your budget must be absolutely astronomical. Uh, but this is also going to focus on libuv uh, 1.44.2, which is the current version used in Node.js 18.x. The most recent version of libuv has some order of execution differences, but we uh, probably won't be covering that. So to start off, let's do a bit of a recap uh, with what you might have seen before. We'll take a look at a simplified version of the Node.js event loop. Um, this is the one I like to use. We have our entry point, index.js, where we run our JavaScript that sets up the initial events and workloads that we're interested uh, in operating on. We then enter the event loop and run any scheduled timers. We then move on to processing our callbacks that have been registered um, with any external events, so that might be network or disk or child processes. Uh, and then we move on to processing callbacks registered with set immediate. And then finally we process our close event and we'll repeat this process as long as there's outstanding work to do or the potential for work to be done. And then right at the end we exit our process. From the perspective of Node, that's a pretty accurate description and I've previously given talks about asynchronous Node that don't really delve any deeper than this. However, we're gonna go a lot deeper. So let's take a look at some of the basics behind libuv. Under the hood, slightly more complex. Uh, we still have our entry and exit points to our loop and a whole bunch of uh, phases that we cycle through in our loop. And now for those of you who are thinking the colors look very familiar, look, back one, there we go. That's because they correspond to the segments of the simplified event loop that we looked at earlier. So at each of these points in the event loop, it's possible for us to schedule some JavaScript to run through the Node.js runtime in response to certain events. Now it's important to note that these stages are all being looped through in a single thread. This means the JavaScript we run is all being processed in a single thread, um, except for workers of course, and the event loop model uh, is therefore used as we assume that most of our workload is going to be I.O. bound, providing ample time for execution in the main thread. Once we start getting to compute bound tasks, we really run the risk of overloading that main thread. So even though we're sort of talking about Node.js and libuv as two parts of a whole, the actual picture is a bit more complex than that. libuv provides some crucial capabilities, but is one library of many underpinning Node.js. Uh, so in user land, right at the top there, we write JavaScript or TypeScript for us cool kids, and it calls functions in the Node.js API. The Node.js API interacts with the Node.js bindings, which can be thought of as a bunch of uh, C++ glue, and uh, you might also have some C++ add-ons being used, which are modules that interact at the lower level with the underlying resources of Node.js, um, and that's when you see Node.jip, that's generally what's going on. And then all of this is underpinned by a host of libraries, such as V8 for the JS runtime, OpenSSL for cryptography, libuv for the event loop, my favorite part, and zlib for compression, and a bunch of others. 
So what makes it a loop? For every event loop, there is a loop condition. And this is the decision that the event loop makes at the end of each iteration to decide whether it should continue executing or whether it should exit. Uh, looking back at our diagram of the libuv event loop, we can see that our loop condition is on the left there. Here's a nice little pointer so you can see it. <laughs> In Node.js, the loop will continue operation on the condition that there is either work actively ongoing or there is the potential for work to happen. And that brings us to two very important concepts in libuv, handles and requests. So handles are long-lived and can be thought of as a reference to an object. Uh, typically, this is used to represent things such as an underlying socket uh, on a HTTP server awaiting a connection or an interval scheduled to run every minute. The event loop keeps track of the number of active handles in the loop. Every handle creation increases the active handle count and uh, every completion or closure of a handle decreases the active handle count. And remember, as long as we have active handles uh, and the count is non-zero, then the event loop will continue operating. So a good example of a handle used in Node.js is an interval. If there's an active interval, then Node.js will not exit. But we can change this behavior if we really want by unreferencing an interval, thereby decreasing the active handle count. Um, or we can re-reference an unreferenced handle, thereby increasing the active handle count. All active handles are uh, referenced by default, and the API for interacting with these handles is actually very transparently uh, defined in libuv. So we can see that we really just have a very thin JS veneer over the top um, of libuv. All handles can be unreferenced in libuv. This includes things like sockets, JS workers, and many more handles. Basically, if you show me a handle in uh, Node.js, I'll show you a dot .unref method. The other thing that keeps Node.js alive is a request. Now, a request can be thought as a short-lived reference to some work currently in flight. Uh, conceptually, these can be thought of more as running like a method or a function. And a good example of a request is the asynchronous file API in Node.js. Now, requests, unlike handles, cannot be unreferenced or re-referenced, as the request represents a single unit of work um, in libuv. However, the unit of work itself can be cancelled. So in Node.js, we use abort controllers to cancel in-flight requests to free up resources. And abort controllers are a web standard uh, that Node.js has adopted. And this is just one of the niceties that Node.js provides us with in order to make programming uh, both back-end and front-end as similar as possible. But once again, it is a very thin veneer over the top of libuv. So Node.js makes use of the UV cancel API uh, to interact with the underlying uh, event loop to cancel that in-flight work. And so now we know what's happening at the active handles or requests question. We know when we're going to exit, when we're going to continue, and all that sort of stuff. So the real question now is what's happening in the rest of the loop? Uh, this is normally the point of the talk where I see people's eyes glaze over, so I have put some memes in here, so keep your eyes out for those. Jumping back to our event loop diagram, we can see the very first thing we do is update the loop time. And this loop time is taken by a reading from a monotonic clock. Monotonic just meaning that successive calls to the uh, uh, requesting data from the clock will never return a lower number than the previous calls. And this loop time is all for internal consumption uh, by libuv. It's not actually related to JavaScript date times or anything like that. That's a separate concept. So then we enter the first block where we can execute some JavaScript. Uh, this is the timer block. And in Node.js, this is any uh, callback that has been registered using the set timeout or set interval functions. And these are analogous to their counterparts in the browser. And remember how we updated the loop time right at the start? Only timers that were scheduled before that update are run. So libuv does not interact with the underlying system timers and interrupts to trigger those callbacks. So system timers are out, monotonic clocks are in. And that means that uh, a timer in Node.js is not a promise that exactly the specified amount of time has elapsed, but rather an indication that at least the specified amount of time has elapsed. And depending on other synchronous work being performed uh, in your program, the delta between the timer expiring and the actual uh, execution of the callback function can grow quite substantially. We then get to the pending callbacks. This has very few practical implications for Node.js. Sometimes it's not always possible to call uh, a callback that's been registered in that iteration of the event loop. So anything that's been deferred is uh, called at this stage on the next iteration. And then next, there are three very special handles inside libuv. 
idle, prepare, and check. And they're all used for fairly similar but slightly different purposes and have different implications for the execution of our loop. First up, I'd like to talk about the prepare handle and the check handles. These handles are an opportunity to run any code we need directly before blocking for I.O. in the case of the prepare handle, or directly after blocking for I.O. in the case of check handles. Other than their position in the event loop, they both operate in an identical fashion. They register callbacks, and those callbacks will be uh, run on every iteration of the event loop. But the most important aspect of these handles is that they don't prevent the poll phase from blocking. Ideally, their use is to augment functionality around the poll phase without actually affecting it directly. Uh, we can't access the prepare handle directly from JavaScript. Node.js does use unreferenced prepare handles and check handles for some loop profiling functionality. Um, but the check handle, on the other hand, can be instantiated directly from JavaScript land. And so the set immediate uh, call will register a callback to be executed in the check phase. Now, this might raise a couple of questions, as the behavior of set immediate is that it does prevent the poll phase from blocking. So to understand how that works, we need to look at the other special type of handle in libuv, uh, the idle handle. So the idle handle is anything but idle. It runs on every iteration of the event loop and prevents the poll phase from blocking, which we'll get to in a little bit more detail later. In Node.js, you cannot interact with the idle handle directly. It's a very big foot gun to hand developers, so it's understandable why this isn't exposed. But under the hood, set immediate executes in the check handles phase, but when you call set immediate, it will also register a self-canceling idle handle so that when we hit the poll phase in the middle of our loop, it will not block. So as the very last action in our event loop, we have our uh, close callbacks. This is another part of the event loop that can be hard to interact with. Generally, cleaning up resources and dealing with the callbacks will be handled in the poll phase. But uh, in some cases, a uh, close, uh, close callback will be executed in this stage, particularly when there's an unclean exit. So the best way I've found to sort of work your way into here is calling socket.destroy. Uh, and yeah, that'll execute in the close callbacks. Now, the last remaining piece of our event loop puzzle is the poll phase. And arguably, this is where most of the interesting stuff happens. Even though it's called the poll phase, it's not actively polling for work. Uh, instead, under the hood, it's using system primitives to make our main thread block until some external impetus wakes us up. Uh, in a well-designed Node.js program that's not under heavy load, this is gonna be where your programs spend probably most of their time. So in order to decide how long we actually need to block for, there's a couple of conditions that result in us doing a zero timeout poll. So firstly, if the loop has been requested to stop, then we're not gonna block here because the loop is gonna exit anyway. We just continue so that the loop can exit gracefully. And likewise, if our continue condition, so not having any active handles or requests, uh, if that continue condition is false, then we won't block, because once again, the event loop is gonna be exiting. If we register any of those idle handles that run the loop flat stick, then the poll phase won't block and we'll be just spinning in place running idle handles all the time on every tick. And finally, if any of our handles are pending close, then we will not block to allow the close callback to be called. So if none of these conditions are met, then how long do we actually want to wait for for some sort of in external impetus to wake us up? Well, that's actually a very simple answer to that question. So we only care about knowing when we need to execute the next timer. So if there's a timer registered, then the poll phase will block until that timer is due uh, to be run. Or if there's no timers, we'll poll indefinitely and wait for a purely external event to wake us up. So, so far we've seen where set immediate, set timeout, and set interval execute in the event loop. Uh, so what executes in the poll phase? Basically everything else. So anything that's interacting with another asynchronous part of the Node.js API will be uh, executed in the poll phase. And so to understand how this poll phase operates, we first need to understand how Node.js interacts with external systems. So anything that Node in Node.js that can be represented with a file descriptor uh, so that can be things like a TCP or UDP socket or a pipe, uh, is handled by the main thread. And this is a very efficient use of operating system resources, which brings us to one of the best features of Node.js. By using minimal system resources for network operations, Node.js can drive thousands of concurrent connections in one process, making it an extremely scalable solution for network-bound I.O. But what happens when the work we're doing can't actually be represented by a file descriptor? Well, for work that needs to occur synchronously in a thread, we offload this work to a thread pool. 
And from the Node.js perspective, in the thread pool, we run file IO, cryptographic functions, workers, DNS lookups, and compression. So let's take a look at the structure of this libuv thread pool and exactly how it operates. Uh, so the thread pool is completely handled by libuv. Node.js will schedule work to be done by the thread pool. And libuv then adds that work to a queue of pending work uh, to be processed. The thread pool then pulls that work from the queue, performs the associated work, and then signals libuv with the result. So I've got four threads specified here, as that's the default for Node.js. Uh, this is actually configurable, and in certain scenarios where your application is bound by the thread pool, then tuning this parameter can actually give you some performance improvement. Uh, because of this structure, it's important to recognize that the thread pool is a finite resource. So it's entirely possible for a series of long-running operations to completely block the thread pool, and this can result in that seemingly unrelated behavior that we uh, talked about earlier, where different workloads are vying for contention. So for example, if we've got long-running cryptographic functions in our thread pool, then it's entirely possible for a quick HTTP request to fail because our thread pool is blocked and we're not able to perform a DNS lookup. So going back to our thread pool model, we can see that the process can be represented quite simply. However, now the question is, that we've got a way to distribute this work out to the thread pool, how do we get that signal back into libuv? And then therefore back into Node.js to call our callbacks. On Linux, this is achieved through a API called eventfd, which uh, essentially creates a file descriptor for the worker thread to notify the main thread that work has been completed. On systems that don't have eventfd, the self-pipe trick is used uh, to much the same effect. Uh, so with this model, our work that has been delegated to the thread pool is represented by file descriptors, and all of the work that exists outside of the thread pool is also represented by file descriptors. So all the work in the system represented by file descriptors, which means that now we can use a very simple Linux API to await all of this work. So on Linux, that API is epol. This takes a list of file descriptors and waits for activity on any of them. On Mac and BSD, this is performed by KQ. On Solaris, we use on event ports and Windows. Uh, we use IOCP, and because Windows is very special, it actually has its own source tree inside libuv to deal with all of that. So now we've gone through all the phases of the event loop, you should have a bit more of an understanding of exactly how Node.js is running in the background. But if you're only gonna remember a couple of things from this presentation, uh, these are the key takeaways. So due to its architecture, if you have network I.O. bound workloads, then Node.js is an excellent choice for that. Uh, all other IOs, such as file IO, DNS, compression, all that sort of stuff is managed through a thread pool, and that thread pool can be exhausted, and that can lead to some weird edge behavior in there. And then finally, if you're doing significant synchronous IO or CPU intensive operations, then you can actually completely freeze up the main thread, blocking the progression of the event loop. Uh, so that's also another gotcha to look out for. So finally, hopefully, I've given you a bit of an indication of exactly uh, what's happening in Node.js and how that relates to underlying principles in libuv and the underlying C API that it's uh, interacting with. So thanks everyone for the, your attention. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. Awesome, big round of applause. <laughs> We've still got a couple of minutes on the clock. Would we, can we squeeze a question or two in before we break for lunch? All right, I'm gonna run back to Dylan first. <laughs> um, so in the interest of being really uh, in the weeds, um, in, in Rust, it's asynchronous runtime. Tokio requires all futures to implement send, which basically means that it's safe to move that work between threads, uh, sorry, between cores for the thread pool. Um, how does libuv handle um, like data safety um, when sort of forking work out to the thread pool, if that makes sense? So my understanding is that there's the right side of the queue is available specifically to libuv in the main thread. So it's using an underlying OS queue to uh, schedule that work out, and the thread pool just reads from that queue. And then in terms of signaling the work back, um, do you use eventfd? I'm not sure exactly what the IPC is between it, but I'm guessing it's probably just pipes or something like that under the hood. Uh, so there's not generally JS executing in the thread pool if that's the question, so um, like that's actually, like the work that's farmed out to the thread pool is generally C, C++ work, so whoever's in charge of, I guess, writing that module is uh, responsible for the memory safety of it. 
I think we've got one more over here. Uh, thanks. Um, why, why is DNS uh, synchronous and therefore it's run on a thread pool thread? Yeah, that's a very good question because you might think that you know you open a socket to a DNS server and make a request and away you go, right? But um, unfortunately, with the range of operating systems that LibUV supports, uh, in order to get a standard API that you know meets the lowest common denominator, they use the system uh, DNS resolver, and that's not always asynchronous. And uh, of course, there's a lot of things that go into DNS resolution on, from the operating system perspective as well, because you have like your host file, and then you might have a local cache, and then you also might actually have to go away and make that call to the DNS server. So uh, if I go back to I have a slide all the way back here. So if you really care about uh, asynchronous DNS, uh, there is Geez, this was a lot further back than I remembered. No, I've gone past it. There we go, C Aries. So C Aries is in there. So uh, if you want to do something around that, you can. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything around uh, Node.js that actually exposes that. But I mean, the other thing I've also done as a bit of a like POC example for a much longer presentation I give is do the DNS request first and cache that um, DNS request response and then get into your long running cryptographic workloads or something like that. So it's always an option. Awesome. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, one more big round of applause for Aiden, please. Thank you.